Dr. Shaughnessy received his Doctor of Pharmacy degree from the Medical University of South Carolina and has his master's in medical education from the University of Dundee. He has completed a faculty development fellowship and the Department of Health and Human Services Primary Health Care Policy Fellowship. He has edited several books and published over 200 papers in the area of family medicine, uh, medical education, evidence-based medicine, pharmacology, prescri prescription writing, and medical information management. Uh, so thank you all for attending and coming to um, uh, this presentation. I, I hope uh, it's useful to you. Uh, it's it's a um, uh, what is what I would call a critical theory approach to depression and and how uh, we think about depression and how we treat depression and and um, hopefully I'll leave with you uh, some ideas and some information that'll be useful. Um, I want to start with my conflicts of interest. Uh, to make every, sure everybody knows where I'm coming from. Uh, financial conflicts of interest. I work uh, for Tufts University. I work for Cambridge Health Alliance. That's our hospital system. Uh, I also work with John Wiley and Sons um, to produce Essential Evidence Plus, um, an editor at American Family Physician. Uh, I also have a small production company called Meducation that makes online CME programs. Uh, my intellectual conflicts of interest is I have uh, published research and editorials critical of depression and depression guidelines, uh, and also the analysis of research into psychiatry drugs. Uh, I'm also a big fan of a topic I'm going to be talking about, which is medical nihilism. Uh, my professional conflicts of interest are that I'm a member of the Society of Teachers of Family Medicine, the North American Primary Care Research Group. And also I have a strong interest in history. So I'm a, a member of the American Institute for the History of Pharmacy and the American Association for the History of Medicine. A little bit about me, about where we're going. So I, I basically have four uh, aspects of this, uh, aspects to this talk. First is I'm gonna talk about depression and how it has evolved from a, the conceptualization of depression from a maladaptation of, to surroundings, to one's surroundings, to a comprehensive disease. Uh, the second, I'm going to talk about the concept of institutional corruption and how it promotes overdiagnosis and overtreatment of depression, especially in primary care. Uh, the third uh, section of my talk will be the lack of evidence supporting the treatment of patients with mild to moderate depression. And then fourth, I'm going to give some ideas about uh, tempering in general our use of medical in interventions through a uh, concept or philosophy I'll call or that is called medical nihilism. It's, it's not my idea, but it's an idea that I like a lot. So that's where I'm gonna go. Um, so let's just get started right off with the idea of moving uh, from maladaptation to a comprehensive disease. The idea that how we think about uh, de what depression is. Now, if we were practicing, uh, oops, hang on, wait a minute. If we were practicing in the 1890s, uh, some of you might have written a prescription that looks something like this, and some of you may have filled a prescription that looks something like this. Uh, this is a prescription for from 1890 for depression, which was not called depression then, it was called neuralgia or nervous atony. And uh, this prescription was for three things, for strychnine, tincture of gentian compound, and calcium hypophosphate, or hypophosphate. Um, this is, uh, would be a, one of the many, many different treatments for people who, uh, who had uh, neuralgia. Uh, so um, that's where we all come from. Where we are today, we all are, of course, aware of. Uh, we've grown up in the, what is called the biological era of psychiatry, where mental health is defined in physiologic terms, right? We talk about serotonin and dopamine, norepinephrine, et cetera, like that. And it's thought to be an imbalance of these that cause people to have the set of symptoms that we call depression. Uh, but it wasn't always that way. Uh, up through uh, really the 1950s, uh, mental health problems were ascribed either to a maladaptation to one's surroundings um, or in some cases a biological cause, but most of them would be under this idea of maladaptation, that um, one, one was not doing well in their surroundings. And um, an actual, at that time, a particular diagnosis was not important. Uh, this was the era of psychoanalysis. This is Freud and Jung and various other groups. Um, <clears throat> in 1952, I'm just gonna give a little history lesson. Um, 
the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual, Statistical Manual from the American Psychiatric Association was first published. And this was the first time that they tried to figure out what the disorders were that were under the general concept of mental health. And they divided them into two groups. Um, there were 102 of them, 102 different uh, disorders, and they were either biological uh, related to infection or some sort of heritable disease, uh, maybe cancer, or the inability to adjust the uh, uh, framework that I talked about before. Uh, there were psychotic and psychoneurotic disorders, and the latter being anxiety, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, emotional instability. These were the general categories. So that was 1952. Uh, by 1968, the DSM-2 was produced. Now we're up to 182 mental health disorders. Uh, but the basic concepts were still the same, these, these two uh, uh, biologic causes or maladaptation causes. Now, this is when people started looking at uh, psychiatry as a, uh, as a specialty and started saying, uh, we're not quite so sure that they're doing the right, the best things for patients. Uh, there were a couple problems that came up at this time. Problem number one was the issue of reliability. Because there were not clear criteria, you can't do a blood test for depression, can't do a blood test for obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, uh, there was no real reliability, no clear line between even what was decided to be mentally ill versus mentally well. Um, as some of you may have heard of an old paper by Thomas Saz, where he basically took uh, uh, graduate students of his and put them into a mental hospital, and uh, they were treated as if they were mentally ill, even though they were uh, as normal as could be for um, graduate students. Um, so what this in introduced was a credibility issue for the psychiatry profession, and the uh, psychiatry profession uh, took some action to figure uh, with the, there was a second problem I'm going to get to in just a moment, but they, they, um, they started to say we need to uh, do things in a different way. Uh, the second problem that psychiatry had was that the psychiatrists were competing with talk therapists, uh, and this was a very overt um, problem that both the American Medical Association and the American Psychiatric Association said, this is, you know, keep out, stay in your own lane. This is our lane. Mental health is what we do, not what you do. And they, there were active and overt ways to try to keep psychologists, social workers, and counselors out of providing therapy. Um, so in order to do that, in order to make the demarcation, they had to say, we need to think of, of mental health in a different way. It's not a Psycho, something that can be deal, dealt with with psychoanalysis, but it's something that is either biologic or genetic. In other words, we have to turn it into something scientific or something along the same way of thinking about it as we do with other disorders in medicine. We have to make it into a, a, a strict medical problem using the medical model. So with this an idea, there became this big pushback against talk therapy, and it was largely driven by money. Uh, Freud was pushed out, and uh, and, and again, I, this is not there was this was you could read articles in JAMA or the New England Journal of Medicine about how psychiatry had to take over the business of mental health. Um, <clears throat> so it's nothing nothing hidden. So in 1980 was the big turnaround in psychiatry, which was the um, with the uh, next level of DSM, which was the DSM three. Now we're up to 265 diagnoses, and there was a clear move to uh, change the model from psychoanalysis to the medical model of psychiatry. Uh, this is the era of biologic society, uh, psychiatry with the creation of very specific diagnostic criteria uh, based on field trials of diagnostic categories. Uh, but these, these initial categories were just created out of thin air. There was, there was no research based on them. They were just said, Okay, here are our criteria. Now we're going to study them. So what happened here is several fold in 1980 was first of all, a clear demarcation between what were called mental health issues. Uh, and these are things that would be treated with drugs or uh, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. Um, and uh, there were these other things that are called neuroses that weren't really part of mental health. They were, um, 
they had to be called something else. So that's when we develop things like PTSD, panic disorder, uh, or anything else that in a sense could be, in one way of thinking about it, could be treated by a drug. Uh, so of course, this ushered in the idea that um, psychiatry now has um, uh, quite a bit of control over what is even called mental health. Uh, the second thing that happened, um, so uh, the second thing happened is that there was a clear demarcation between what was healthy uh, mental health and, um, and abnormal mental health. And, and these were clearly defined and the abnormal was treated by psychiatry. Uh, like I said, the Psych American Psychiatric Association now, this is the only organization that I'm aware of that decides uh, what it is, the illnesses that are called, what are called the illnesses that they can treat and, and therefore what other people can't treat. And then lastly, of course, was now we have an ability to have certain diseases for which drugs can be used. And all we have to do now is develop those drugs or use the drugs that are already available to us. So the major change away from talk therapy in 1980. So as a result, DSM-4 came along in, in 1994, 1980, 1994. Now we're up to almost 300 illnesses. Uh, and as Oprah, uh, to, par to uh, parody, I guess, not paraphrase, parody, uh, Oprah, everybody has a diagnosis. So now with the idea that we're going to have a demarcation between what is mental health and not mental health, now there is the diagnostic creep that happens. There's the market expansion in psychiatry to say, Let's look at everyday disorders of life, every, everyday things that happen that, that cause uh, stress or problems with people, and let's see if they can be you know, eligible, if we can find a drug to treat those. Um, so again, what we're doing further here is we're allowing, in fact, sanctioning the expansion of drug therapy into areas that would normally be treated with talk, talk therapy. In 2013 was the DSM-5. We're back down to 157 diagnoses. Uh, the other important thing, if you'll notice the five, we went from uh, Roman to Arabic numerals. I don't know how critical that is, but that's when we made the switch. Um, there were 157 disorders, but uh, there was uh, a lot of this was just due to clumping of existing things. Uh, but also in 2013 with DSM-5, another thing happened um, <clears throat> is that a lot of different uh, disorders now became medicalized. A lot of different um, things that people experience become medicalized. And for example, uh, Asperger's. Um, autism was now called uh, autism spectrum disorder. Asperger's um, uh, became part of that spectrum. Uh, and we could now treat people who didn't have any specific cognitive delay or language development, but as soon as they qualified, we could begin to treat them with disease. Uh, temper tantrum is now called dis disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Um, we now said that bereavement after a loss can be considered a mental illness worthy of treatment. Uh, these are all out of DSM-5. Uh, if you have one blowout meal, a month, you qualify as having binge eating disorder. These are all criteria from DSM-5. So what we're doing now is, like I said, with DSM-5 in the, in the last 10 years or so, we've had this uh, marked creep into everyday life and, um, and making all sorts of things, like I said, available for uh, pharmaceutical treatment. So let's talk about how some people have looked at this. And I have a bunch of quotes. These are long, and I'll read them quickly to you. Um, <clears throat> this is from Tom Insel, the former Institute of National Institute of Mental Health in the United States. He said, I spent 13 years at MIMH really pushing, pushing on the neuroscience and genetics of medical disorders, mental disorders. And when I look back on that, I realized that while I, what I think su I succeeded at getting lots of really cool papers published by cool scientists at fairly large costs, I think $20 billion, I don't think we moved the, the needle in reducing suicide reducing hospitalizations, improving recovery for the tens of millions of people who have mental illness. So a insider naysayer. Uh, Alan Francis also has weighed in on this. Uh, if anyone's familiar with Alan Francis, he was the head of the DSM-4 committee, but also quite critical at that time and continues to be of the DSM process. 
He says, I object to the NIMH research agenda that is narrowly brain reductionistic. It has achieved great intellectual masterpieces, but so far has not helped yet a single patient. So that's where we are. So I'm gonna talk about how that happened. And if, you, if you're starting to see the flavor in which I'm, I'm approaching this, I'm looking at it from the idea that we've got a structural problem in how we think about mental health and depression. And I'm gonna talk about the second step here, which is the idea of institutional corruption, overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And from what I'm gonna present in the next five or so minutes from a book and an article. Uh, the book is called Psychiatry Under the Influence. It's by uh, um, Lisa Cosgrove and Bob Whit Whitaker. Uh, I work with Lisa Cosgrove. Her name will come up in a, in a minute, talking about how the pharmaceutical companies have really changed the way we think about mental health. And then also going to talk about a fairly recent paper called Epistemic Corruption, the Pharmaceutical Industry and the Body of Medical Science. So this whole, th whole section is drawn from these two books or these two sources. So I'll start off with the definition of what is institutional corruption. And this is from uh, Bob and Lisa's book. Uh, and th this is just a quote from that book. When the institution, uh, in, in this case, the Institute of Medicine, Institution of Medicine or Institution of Psychiatry, uh, the system or process allows or encourages legal systematic practices that draw the institution away from its mission and undermine its integrity. In other words, somewhere along the way, the institution gets off course and is no longer meeting its original mission. And what happens frequently with this, and we're seeing this play out every day in the newspapers, is the loss of public trust. Uh, the interest of the institution overwhelms the truth seeking that's supposed to be part of that institution. Um, I'll give you a couple examples of this in a second. Related to this is the idea of epistemic corruption. This is from the second paper and similar. When a knowledge system, a way of knowing, that's a, uh, a, uh, epistemology, when a knowledge system importantly loses integrity, ceasing to provide the kinds of trusted knowledge expected of it, which often occurs because the system has been co-opted for interests at odds with some of the central goals thought to lie behind it. So this is when our whole, we're, we're all in the evidence-based medicine business, but when the the corpus of information that we call evidence gets systematically corrupted. We have uh, corruption of our whole knowledge process. So the idea here is that uh, we're not talking about a few bad apples in the barrel. We're talking about the bad, the, the barrel as being bad, it's, it's rotten. Um, because what happens is within that barrel, all the actions of the individuals are accepted as being legal or, or uh, ethical, but yet they're not right. Uh, it's because the system in which holds them is wrong. So let me talk a little bit more about that. How does it happen? Well, it's primarily due to conflicts of interests uh, where the people working within the institution, um, the, the institution changes because of these conflicts of interest. These conflicts can be financial, intellectual, or professional. I gave you my examples of my conflicts uh, when I started this. So what are financial conflicts of interest? Well, those are kind of easy to understand. Um, <clears throat> and Lisa Cosgrove and I mentioned her, she wrote the book, um, and I have been working for several years to look at how uh, financial conflicts of interest exist at many levels, from pharmacology textbooks, the clinical practice guidelines. And we published several of these looking at how guidelines can be affected by um, the conflicts of interest or, or there is, I'll, I'll call it association, not necessarily causation because we don't know that. So for example, I'm gonna give you from the American Psychiatric Association guidelines on the treatment of depression. This is what we found in a study that we looked at when we looked at the, these new guidelines. Uh, financial guidelines or fi financial ties to industry were disclosed by 100% of the guideline development committee. And these ranged, these were a mean, there was a mean of 20.5 relationships, a range of nine to 33. Uh, <clears throat> and these were mostly on pharmaceutical uh, speakers bureaus. So yes, the, the list of conflicts of interest for the APA guidelines go on and on and on because the average person had 20 of them. 
Uh, we also uh, looked uh, a couple years ago at uh, psychopharmacology textbooks. And, um, and uh, my, one of my more cynical takeaways is, is that I was in the wrong business here because look at, uh, this is over 10 years. If you look at the right hand column, uh, some of the editors of, not all of them, but some of the editors of psychopharmacology textbooks uh, had a significant amount of income coming from the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, if you look in the middle of the table is one author who received over $10 million over the span of nine years. Now, we just, we just listed the ones um, that uh, received, uh, I think we had 10 in our cohort, 10 books, and the other five didn't have any pharmaceutical industry uh, payment to editors. Um, what about intellectual conflict of interest? Uh, intellectual conflict is, is, just, is the idea that we love our own ideas. Uh, this is a, a quote from Gordon Guyatt and group, his, uh, his group, academic activities that create the potential for an attachment to a specific point of view that could unduly affect an individual's judgment about a specific recommendation. These are intellectual conflicts of interest. Um, and if you've ever heard the um, uh, stories uh, of, about Lee Wobegon, all the children are above average. Well, all of our results are better than everybody else's. All of our research is better than everybody else's. How does this play out? Again, in, in our analysis of the American Psychiatric Association, uh, we found, <clears throat> excuse me, that 17 of 100, 13% of the 130 papers that were used to support the American Psychiatric Association guidelines on treatment of depression were published by one of the guideline developers. So they either had incredible expertise or they ignored any information that wasn't uh, uh, generated by them. Now, the third area where the barrel can become rotten is professional conflicts of interest. Uh, this is when the idea that a, a guideline becomes an official statement from a professional group or society. Uh, and you can find this easily when you look at a guideline and it says that it was approved by some organization or it was an official guidance from uh, a lot of groups do this. Um, and here's a, here's a quote that was in a, um, an editorial uh, over 10 years ago that I, I like a lot and I think about a lot when I look at guidelines. And it says, although it is true that individual medical providers care deeply about their patients, the Guild of Healthcare Professionals, including their specialty societies, has a primary responsibility to promote its members' interests. And you think about the, the groups that you are part of, the professional groups, their main goal is to support your needs. Um, ideally, also the needs of society, but the primary goal is to support who uh, is in that group. So I wanna give you an example of this outside of, of, of uh, mental health. This is an example of some in the treatment of sub or the diagnosis and treatment of subclinical hypothyroidism, which for those of you not aware of it, it's a controversial issue of, of, of uh, whether it even exists. Is there such a thing as subclinical hypothyroidism? It's the idea that uh, 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 thyroid uh, hormone levels are low or TSH levels are high, but uh, people don't have any symptoms. So the question is, well, how do you know if you're fixing them if they don't have any symptoms in the first place? Uh, about uh, 15 years ago or so, uh, various thyroid groups in the United States got together and said, we want to develop an evidence report and then we're gonna develop, issue our own guidelines. So the evidence report came out and was published and said that there wasn't any good evidence to say that we should either screen for or treat subclinical hypothyroidism. Then the groups issued their own set of recommendations based on the guidelines. And they said, although good evidence is unavailable to support our recommendation, there is a sizable amount of fair evidence and an abundance of opinion by experts. The scientific panel recommendations, the ones I just mentioned, are contrary to the practice of many experts. So again, you can see how the professional conflict of interest was in here. Um, you could also say it's another way of knowing but it's the idea that when the evidence doesn't support what we're thinking about, we're gonna support our members. So that's when you know, like our professional conflict of interest comes into play. 
So like I said, at the end of the day, we end up with not individuals doing anything bad, it's the institution itself, it's the barrel, that's the problem. Um, because none of these things are inherently illegal. Um, okay, so what happens as a result of this? Well, the result we have is diagnostic creep. Uh, we end up with, uh, somebody has said, an ill for every pill. Uh, we find reasons to treat, or we find reasons to use various medications um, by create, in some cases, creating diseases, the idea of disease mongering. Uh, this results in overdiagnosis, telling people uh, label, but not being their best interest to be labeled with. Uh, overtreatment results from this, and most importantly, as I'll get to at the very end here, we ignore the root causes. So for example, the diagnostic creep in mental health. Um, <clears throat> if you look at uh, incidence and prevalence st uh, studies, about 25% of the general population has a mental health um, label, a diagnosis. And over one life, you have about a 50-50 chance of getting a mental health diagnosis, mental health diagno disorder diagnosis. Uh, so when half the population eventually ends up with a mental, with a, a, some sort of mental health diagnosis, we have to ask ourselves, uh, have we gone too far? So now I'm going to hone in a little bit more and give you some practical information about the treatment of mod, mild to moderate depression, and basically just very quickly overview the research into the benefit of treating people with of various antidepressants instead of using placebo. And because <clears throat> the problem we have, I don't know if it's a problem, it all depends on, on your viewpoint of things. Because uh, antidepressant drugs, any drug medications work um, for a substantial amount of people. The problem is, or like I said, the quandary is, so does placebo. So the question is, um, um, are we giving medicines that when we could just as easily give placebo? Or uh, what is it about um, uh, the giving of medicines that makes them work? So I've got three meta-analyses here uh, that show all show basically the same idea. This one was published in 2010, uh, uh, depression severe, relating depression severity to antidepressant drug treatment. And it said, the magnitude of benefit of antidepressant medications compared with placebo increases with severity of depression symptoms and may be minimal or non-existent on average in patients with mild to moderate symptoms. And I work in primary care, that's the group of people that we see most of the time, minimal or non-existent. And what they didn't say is compared with placebo. Uh, in 2008, a second study looking at uh, even more data, or I mean, looking at uh, data in a different way, uh, not looking at patient level data, they, they looked at now uh, HRSD, is the Hamilton rating uh, of symptoms of depression or scale of depression. And that is most frequently used in drug therapy studies because it's the most sensitive to small changes in, um, in uh, scoring. Uh, it says the weighted mean improvement was 9.6 uh, points in the HRSD in the drug group and 7.8 in the placebo groups, yielding a mean drug placebo difference of 1.8. So I want you to remember those numbers, 9.6 versus 7.8, a 1.8 difference in the Hamilton rating scale. Uh, <clears throat> what they found was the same the other two studies, that drug placebo differences in antidepressant efficacy increases as a function of baseline severity, but even relatively small, or are relatively small, even for severely depressed patients. So we've got three meta-analyses saying that for mild to moderate depression, uh, at least uh, antidepressants are no more effective than placebo. So, um, <clears throat> oops, got this one. Uh, this one, um, 21 antidepressant drugs, uh, a network meta-analysis. We found that all antidepressants included in the meta-analysis were more efficacious than placebo in adults with major depressive disorder and the summary effect sizes were mostly moderate. Modest, modest, excuse me, sorry. So again, we've got um, just met all these meta-analyses lining up to say that antidepressants are no more effective than placebo. So the question is why? 
Uh, well, there's, I don't know, and I'm just postulating it several ideas, but why um, does giving something to somebody make them better? Well, um, that's what we would call the placebo response or the expectation effect. Now, if any of you are in, in, in primary care and deal with people other than with mental health disorders, uh, you know that uh, pain is a big problem and uh, that's for another lecture. But um, <clears throat> what if I said that um, uh, if you just gave this bracelet to people, prescribe this bracelet to them, that 70%, 77% of them would experience pain relief. Well, you'd think I was quite crazy, but that's what happened. 610 patients with pain. Uh, and I would call this in, in the middle range, 4.3 to 5.7 out of a possible 10. Uh, they gave them either, these were called, um, at the time they were called the Q-ray bracelet. And they, they were ionized with something that, that decreased your pain. And um, they gave them identical looking, or identical looking bracelets and half of them were ionized and half of them weren't. Uh, uh, at four weeks, a month later in the Q-ray group, the average score was 1.7 to 2.6 uh, uh, centimeters lower. In the placebo group, it was 1.3 to 2.5 lower. So no difference, but still yet a significant difference, uh, a substantial change in scores in pain, 77% people globally reported pain relief. Uh, the thing is that half the group uh, in the study had heard of the bracelet and almost all of them felt that it would work. So that's the, uh, what I attribute to the expectation of that is that when people want something to work, it will work. There's also the concept of conditioning. Uh, this is a study of analgesia after uh, spine surgery. They gave the 51 patients and they, they got some sort of of uh, oral uh, analgesic after spine surgery. Now, in half of them, half of these patients, they also received the placebo and they said, we want every time you take your, the pain medicine, we want you to take this other medicine, which is a placebo, but we think it will help. That was the wording. Uh, it is a placebo. It doesn't have any active effect, but we think it will help. And then we want you to take those religiously for the first two days. And then after that, you can take, uh, we want you to keep taking the placebo, but only take the pain medicines as you need them. You have to keep, keep taking the placebo for the next, uh, three times a day for the next, um, I think week or something like that. But um, you take the, uh, the pain medicine only if you need it in addition. And what they found that the group on average had 30% less analgesic use when they took the placebo. So, and that just, and they set this up specifically as to set up operant conditioning where they, where patients associated with a placebo with pain relief, probably, most probably due to the actual analgesic. So that's the second reason. The third reason might be uh, the natural history of depression. Uh, without, we can't do these studies now, um, but um, this was done, I think, yeah, in the, in the early 80s. Uh, episodes of depression last from two months to several years with an average of around five to six months. Uh, one third of patients recover within a year. So that's a huge, huge variation in the natural history of depression. Um, but it just tells me that some people, regardless of treatment, are going to get better or they're getting better as we're treating them. And it's because of the natural history. The fourth, and I'm just, I'm just speculating here on all of these, the fourth is the concept of regression or return to the mean. And that's the idea that outlying findings uh, tend to return to the average over time. Uh, an example of this is that um, uh, on the right there, the father and the son, um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just over, uh, oh dear, I forgot to convert. I'm just over six feet tall. Um, and I have one son who is about six three. Now, if so, I'm above average size. He's above average size and taller than me. So that, what if if that should keep going like that, um, you know, in a couple of generations, we should have Shaughnessy's that are about eight feet tall. But as we all know, that won't happen. Um, that his children, on average, will be shorter. Uh, on yeah, on average, would be shorter than he is because he is an outlier. 
Um, the same with uh, the other example is Einstein, uh, Albert Einstein, brilliant person. Um, <clears throat> uh, he only had one child who survived to adulthood, but then he had grandkids. Uh, he had four grandchildren. Uh, uh, none of them, as far as I know, were, uh, they're were all very special people, but they weren't geniuses. So again, he was an outlier and subsequent um, heredity returned to the, the average. So the fourth thing I wanted to touch base on is the concept of medical nihilism as an approach to care and how it can lead to uh, maybe a different way of thinking about how to use medicines and medical interventions. The concepts that I'm gonna talk about are from this book called Medical Nihilism by uh, Jacob Stagenga. He also has a YouTube channel called Visai. If you wanna read either one of the book is fascinating. I've, I've read it twice. Uh, the, the YouTube videos are very good as well. Um, and it's a, it, it's a conceptualization that he, he is a medical philosopher uh, about how to treat and take care of people. Uh, <clears throat> oh, so yeah, so here's the book. Uh, and here's a uh, picture of his YouTube video. Uh, medical nihilism is the concept that we should have little confidence in the effectiveness of medical interventions. Uh, that's his idea. Uh, we all are, are, what he would say is we're much too uh, baseline optimistic in our, our, our faith in uh, medical treatments. Uh, we have all have a toolbox of things that we can do to help people. And we have an inherent idea that these tools are all good for people. And he basically says, no, we should approach it from the other direction. And we say there should be little confidence in what we do. And um, uh, we should work out of that idea. Now, the problem with that, uh, if you're a practicing clinician day to day, that's like going to work every day with a, a toolbox full of broken tools and saying, I got to do my job, but I have all these broken tools. So that's, uh, that's one of the pro hard problems with accepting his idea. But he has three basic arguments uh, about why we should take this approach. And his first argument, and, and all of us who do research in this know this is the case, is that research is malleable. Uh, the design, the execution, the analysis, interpretation, publication, and even the marketing of medical studies involves fine, numerous little little choices that are made. And these choices are being made in a variety of ways. And these decisions influence what is to be taken as pertinent evidence in medical intervention under investigation. In other words, uh, depending on decisions made early in the process or even sometimes late in the process, uh, research findings can be uh, uh, resulting conclusions that are not necessarily um, what we think they are. Uh, so let me just walk through those, I guess, for a moment. Um, <clears throat> he says that it, you know, and we're all familiar with this, it could be the recruitment of patients. Uh, it could be the design of the study itself. It could be the analysis of the study. Uh, when you look at mental health specifically, um, we, we have issues of selection bias and who is recruited into studies. Um, uh, most of the studies, most of the drugs that we use for the treatment of depression have only been studied for 12 weeks. So it's a short duration treatment for, a, or, or for a, something that lasts six months to two years. Um, there is a move, for, move right now in the uh, mental health literature to use what's called an enriched design. Uh, and this is designed to sort out people you know, be, because of the placebo problem. We want to sort out the people who respond to placebo. Uh, so we find the people who, do who don't respond to placebo by just giving them placebo and seeing if they respond. And then we say, okay, then we will uh, do a randomized controlled trial comparing placebo to an active drug. Um, uh, Jacob Stegangas, he says that's, that's akin to like um, finding only people who like chocolate ice cream and then randomizing them to receive vanilla or chocolate ice cream and then asking which one which group had greater satisfaction in their ice cream. Uh, so that's not exactly the way to do it. <clears throat> we found the same thing. We just probably, in fact, this paper was just uh, published yesterday. Um, uh, looking at uh, a case study, we looked at a meta-analysis and we looked 
really deeply at this meta-analysis of long-acting injectable antipsychotics to see how they made decisions at each step of the way. And we found that a couple small decisions, if they were made differently, would have changed the results. And these, um, uh, these decisions they made, made were most likely, or would, again, it's association, not causation, were associated with the uh, pharmaceutical company influence. So as a result, small changes in, in this case, meta-analysis, but also small changes in how research is conducted can change results in the conclusion. So that's his concept of, of, of um, research being malleable. And we all know that, and that's why we all do the jobs that we're doing. His second argument is that even when we do find a difference, the, the effect sizes are really small. So remember that, that um, uh, analysis that I showed you. Um, had a small increase, small change in a small difference in Hamilton uh, rating scale of depression scores from one you know, placebo versus active drug. Um, NICE uh, over in the UK says a clinically relevant difference on the Hamilton scale is at least three, three or more. Now, if you look at the Hamilton depression scale, uh, if you go from having difficult, say, I so it's an interview. Uh, the Hamilton depression, if you've not used it, is, a, is an interview asking people questions. Not They don't fill it out themselves. Uh, if they go from saying, I had nightly difficult falling asleep to no difficult, that changes the score by two points. If they deny that they're ill, uh, no, I'm not depressed. And then after some period of time, they acknowledging being ill, that's also two points. So you just take those two criteria out of all the criteria for depression and say, okay, if they move the needle on those two things, now there is a clinically relevant difference between one treatment and another. So there's a huge bias towards sleep in the Hamilton depression scale uh, and, this, and another bias towards uh, being ill. And what I'm trying to say is that uh, we walk around with a lot of things we do uh, the effect size between one treatment or another and one treatment versus not treatment or versus placebo is very small in the first place. And he, he shows in, in this example for depression, just how a couple items on, on the depression scale, Hamilton depression scale, can make it look like a drug works better uh, than, a, than another drug or drug works better than placebo. Uh, his third argument is that there are no magic bullets. Um, in psychiatry. Now the magic bullet idea, uh, those of you who are interested in, in the history of, of medicine, is the idea that we can treat something um, and it affects just the problem without affecting anything else. So it's very specific and it's very effective. And the example of this and where the first magic bullet was, uh, uh, was called that were antibiotics. They affect uh, bacteria, but they don't affect human body cells. Uh, and those were called magic bullets. Uh, and what he points out with uh, a lot of things we do in medicine, there are no magic bullets. Again, I'll go back to this picture. We all are familiar with this. Uh, you know, we say that depression could be caused by changes in you know, uh, serotonin, in alpha receptors, norepinephrine. Uh, we've got all sorts of mechanisms here. And indeed, we've got all sorts of drugs that affect all of these. And, um, and we'd say, but yeah, okay, but that's our, that's depression. Um, so we don't have a single bullet theory and it probably doesn't exist because depression is so multifactorial. Um, this, so in, in other words, what's saying, just because we affect serotonin levels in the synaptic cleft doesn't mean that um, pe people are gonna get better from depression. Uh, that this sort of one, one-to-one -one, uh, explanation isn't really real. The other problem we have is, um, <clears throat> again, this is directly a direct lift from his book. Uh, this, is, uh, this is all the receptors that aripiprazole affects. Uh, so certainly not a magic bullet. And it does something to all of these in some way that might affect uh, patients experiencing uh, depressive symptoms. But we don't really know. Uh, so it's really hard for me to say uh, uh, this is how any of these drugs work. I call it backward pharmacology. We say, oh, they affect serotonin, so serotonin must be the problem, or norometaphenephrine must be the problem. Uh, even uh, uh, fluoxetine, we call it an SSRI. 
but if you look in the right hand column, all of the uh, uh, receptor or all of the uh, uh, neurotransmitters that it affects and where it binds, it, it binds to all sorts of things, uh, just to, to uh, serotonin differently. So uh, we don't really have a magic bullet theory. So his, his idea is that uh, we need to be much more cautious in how we approach things. So the pushback to Stiganga is what I'll finish with in the next couple of minutes. And this is the general concept where I got the title, which is that medicine is awesome. That will, all we have to do is we say, yeah, Alan, you've been naysaying for almost 45 minutes here now. But the idea here is that, um, we do so much good for medicine, and that is exactly true. Except when you look at drugs, um, this is a, a poll of the most important medical advances since 1840. This was done in British Medical Journal. And I've, all, I've highlighted the relatively few uh, drugs that are on this list. Most of the things we've done to improve the health uh, and lifespan of people are not medicines. Um, so I have a couple solutions I'll leave you with, and then we'll have time for some questions. The first solution is a conceptual approach, and that is the idea of epistemic humility, becoming an epistemically virtuous clinician. Uh, <clears throat> epistemic humility is the idea is that the threat to medicine is not that we do not know things. The threat is that we create a sense of certainty out of uncertain knowledge, that we profess to know things that we simply don't. This results in a, uh, what I call a slide to certainty. Uh, we have a tendency to find solace in scientific findings, right? We're, we're doing things based on the best science, but average effects are codified into best practices. These, these best practices become benchmarks for quality of care. Then, as we all know, failing to meet these benchmarks is conceived as a poor decision-making and ultimately poor patient care. Best practices and quality benchmarks may provide support for clinicians and may even provide a sense that healthcare decisions are grounded in objective science and not arbitrary, but such practices and benchmarks do not eliminate the uncertainty of the patient's outcome. We're all familiar with that. Uh, the second is political, is reconceptualizing depression as a social disorder. Um, and this is some work that I've done, uh, uh, Lisa and I and a number of other people for the United Nations is is reconceptualizing mental health as not a, um, is not a, the absence of a mental health condition, but is instead uh, defined by the social, psychosocial, political, and economic and physical environment that enables individuals and populations to live a life of dignity with full enjoyment of their rights and the equitable pursuit of their potential. So instead of a disease model, we're looking for a wellness model. The third thing we can do at an individual level is to ask ourselves, when we prescribing anything, using anything, uh, ordering testing, is how well does it work? In whom does it work? Do the benefits outweigh the risks? And are the benefits worth the cost? Uh, this allows us, if we do this for depression, we allows us to think about things other than medicines to treat people. Uh, we can use exercise, other approaches uh, that patients can do. Maybe they work just due to placebo, but the bottom line is, as I mentioned earlier, placebo works pretty well. Uh, I'll leave you with this. Uh, I know I'm speaking to a largely Canadian group, so I've got to, um, everybody recognizes who this is, who said one of the first duties of the physician is to educate the masses, not to take medicine. And that's the idea of medical nihilism. So I will stop there uh, and we'll see what kind of questions we have. Alan, that was great. Thank you so much. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to get straight into the question. So the first one is, about uh, Bob Whitaker's book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, and what are your views? Do you think his position was quite radical? It is, his position is quite radical, um, uh, but I, I, I like, so I'm, I'm a bit of an iconoclast. If you've read anything I've written, I, I take a sort of an iconoclastic approach to everything. And I like the idea of at least, as Bertrand Russell said, it's good every now and then to hang a question mark on things we know for certain. And that's what, that's what he does, and that's what I do. And as soon as I hear anybody with any certainty say, oh, yes, you definitely have to do this, I say, really? And I say, can you just frame that in the form of a question? Do we definitely need to do that? And that opens up discussion away from dogmatism. Okay, thank you. Uh, someone mm -hmm. responded to that as well and said, Whitaker is passionate, but so is Thomas Saz. The experience 
significant marginalization from the conventional establishment as a result of the intellectual basis for their critiques. And that can radicalize a person to some extent. But if you look at the data on which they base their positions, it is much more sound than would appear to be the case at first glance. So you have some support in the group. Um, so right, and, um, looking... uh, what, what I and what I see is is just a, uh, everything that we do in medicine, the pendulum swings from one place to the other. Mm -hmm. And we swing from, yes, we've got to deinstitutionalize people to um, to saying everything is a mental illness now. And as long as we can give them medicines, because I mean, medicines are expensive, right? But not compared with not compared with social change, mm -hmm. not even close. Uh, another comment here taken as equivalent to the strength of the placebo effect. Response in placebo conditions incorporates placebo response plus spontaneous recovery. And that's important because we are treating depressive episodes, which are episodic. I, I would agree with that, yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Another comment, Cipriani, the, one of the meta-analyses you presented was by Cipriani and they're referring to this, I believe. Cipriani is touted as a repudiation of Kirsch in their conclusions, but almost exactly replicates the Kirsch results in effect size and odds ratios. In fact, they found effect sizes overall slightly smaller than Kirsch. So I wonder if you had any further comments on the differences between Cipriani and Kirsch. Well, I, I didn't. I didn't. Didn't want to cite Kirsch because it was such an inflammatory thing at the time. But yeah, so Irvin Kirsch's stuff are very similar. And it, what I was trying to show with this is that we keep trying to find a meta analysis to say there's a marked benefit to treating mild to moderate depression. We simply have not been able to. Okay. And uh, another comment uh, asking you about some comments made by Dr. Bruce Errol in New Zealand. And he likes to use the term being stuck and doesn't use the term depression. Uh, what do you think about that? For example, he uses acceptance and mindfulness strategies to help people transform their relationship with unwanted distressing experiences, such as disturbing thoughts, unpleasant emotions, painful memories, or uncomfortable physical symptoms. It seems to me it it's aligns with your work for the United Nations on a wellness approach. Mm -hmm. And, and it's an individual approach. And I, what, what I get, I, I like the concept a lot because right the only, at the end of the day, the only person I can control is myself. And so if I am stuck and I wanna work on getting unstuck um, to move out of that paradigm, but um, um, that's easy to say, I, I'm, I'm upper middle-class white. Um, uh, I don't have the social, uh constraints on happiness that many people have and so I, I would not want us so that's at the individual level but i wouldn't want us to say you know we, we have to we can step away we can just make it everybody's personal responsibility to be happy no matter what your situation is sure um, a question from you uh or for you uh what do you think about the term disorder is that part of the marketing spin. We don't refer to a sprained ankle or a fractured femur as a disorder. Is it something to do uh, to imply that something is permanent or at least very long-term? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know, but I'm sure it has been um, focus group to death, right? Um, by by some, somebody who said, what, what is the best term for this? You know, to elicit the most, um, reaction to it. I don't know. Okay. Um, another question for you. Opponents of opioids for pain and some experienced physicians believe that in at least some patients, opioid therapy may perpetuate or worsen pain. Do we know whether antidepressant drugs or other treatments for depression, anxiety might prolong the episodes or ultimately worsen the condition? After all, the longest RCTs are one year, so far as I know. Yeah. I, again, I, that's a great topic, the issue of, um, of is there permanent or at least long-term changes that occur with antidepressants? And um, Bob and Lisa in their book go into that quite a bit. I, for time, decided not to do that. But the idea that there's a permanent, it's not just um, relapse. Um, there is, um, it's, it's actually, there's another model of looking at um, antidepressants as being, um, uh, causing a dependence. Mm -hmm. And if you start looking at it in that model, 
like you would with opioids, then it's a whole different way of thinking about it. Yeah, and in fact, I think someone responded with some data to support that, that uh, compared to placebo, the, there may be some worse outcomes in the long term. Right, antidepressants. Right. That concept, um, yeah. So the other one comment, and I think we'll end there, uh, after this one, medical nihilism often gets criticized as clinical inertia. Do you think sometimes doing nothing thoughtfully is harder than writing a prescription? Uh, oh, well, I just refer that back to everybody here and let you. Uh, yeah, the common uh, a common thing I often say is I say don't just do something, stand there. Mm -hmm. And how difficult that is. There is a huge amount of activism in medicine. Um, and there's always the something else, something else, something else that I can do for people. Um, and, and it's very difficult to stop that. So I don't think it's very difficult to just, just not do something, stand there. Okay. And with that, I'll invite Dr. Tom Perry to thank you, Alan, because I know he's a big fan of yours and he was instrumental in getting you to speak. So Tom, over to you. Thank you, Alan. You can see, well, maybe you can't see, but we can send it to you if you want the discussion in the chat, which has been quite vigorous. And I think the furthest person away who chose to identify himself is a family physician in Morocco. Uh, so he's maybe further away than the uh, pharmacist uh, at the Drugs and Therapeutics Bulletin in England or uh, the journalist in France, but we thank everyone who attended. The best way to wrap it up, Ellen, is to quote um, Dr. Mark McConnell, a general experienced general internist at the Veterans Administration in Wisconsin, who says in the chat, absolutely tremendous, humble and wise, should be required course for anyone who wants to have the privilege of writing a prescription. Thank you again, Ellen. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Appreciate everyone's uh, interactions.